tonight's live event. This is our third week doing it this week, and we are excited to be doing this with you again. So unfortunately, like we've had the last two weeks, it's, it's a bit cloudy tonight, and we were hoping that we might be able to pull off some live imaging, but it looks like we're not gonna be able to do it tonight with the clouds. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna be showing some images like we did last week. We're gonna be talking a lot about these images. Some of these images we captured this past week. Some of them are a little bit older than that. And we're gonna have a discussion about it. Now, like we've noted before, the reason we're doing this is because we're all stuck home, just like you guys. And we're getting cabin fever and we'd like to get outside and do some imaging. And we miss seeing all you guys at the observatory. Looking forward to the Friday nights at the observatory is such an amazing time. And us not being able to meet with you guys there, it, it makes us lonely. And though we're out there working during the week and we have the stars to keep us company, there's really nothing like seeing the inspiration on all of our visitors' faces when they come out to the observatory. So until we can open again, we're gonna to continue to show as much as we can from our homes and we're gonna do it every Friday night and potentially additional nights throughout the week. So I wanna give a quick shout out as well to everyone who came on last week's live stream and, and everyone who donated. Like, I, I can't tell you how amazing that is. Right now, not being able to open, it does put a financial strain on our organization and it, it, it's difficult and it, it stresses us out. We're not gonna close. We're gonna continue to operate. We're gonna continue to function. Though we are stretched really thin and your donations make a humongous difference to everything that we're doing. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I can't tell you how much the team appreciates it. You know, and we love you guys for doing it and we're awesome because of you. During tonight's session, you'll notice that the, in the description underneath the video is a link to our donations page. <clears throat> if you've learned something great or if you're having a good time or you just like Frosty Drew and what we're doing, then please donate, hook us up. This helps us stay open year round and offer free stargazing nights every Friday to the public. So on tonight's session tonight, we have some Frosty Drew astronomers. We have some Frosty Drew sky evangelists serving as moderators and we have a special guest. So you have our astronomers tonight, you have me, Scott McNeil, you have Derek Schott and you have Gavin Olson. Our sky evangelists on tonight serving as moderators, you have Jessica McNeil and you have Lindsay Abrams. And tonight we have a special guest this guy is an amazing individual. I'm sure a lot of you have met him in the field. And if you haven't, then it, you're missing out. His name is James Crouch. And he is one of the hottest night photographers in the Southern New England area right now. He produces fantastic images of the night sky, the Milky Way, the moon, and even astronomical photos of celestial objects. Every month, he holds several workshops on how to successfully capture fabulous images of the Milky Way. He calls them Our Galaxy Workshops. And once you meet James, you, you pick up his positive personality. He's got an excellent positive attitude and it is very contagious. When I first met James, it was about five years ago, and he came to the observatory one night with a bunch of other night photographers and he was so ambitious to learn whatever he could about the night sky, about photography, about astronomy, and he was just eating it up. Jump ahead five years, and James is now one of the best night photographers in the area. So we're gonna turn the session over to James now, where he's gonna show some images, talk a little bit about what he does, and about how he got there. So everyone give it up for James. Hi, everybody out there. I hope everybody's having a good night. Uh, looks like we do have a good night ahead of us in a couple hours. Hope everybody can get out under the stars tonight. A nice moonless experience. I guess what I'm going to do right away is I'm going to open this up by showing you guys some of my images. And then we can talk a bit more, help you guys get more familiar with who I am, what I do, my profession, my workshops, uh, and a little bit about my personal life as well, too. So uh, let me switch over here. Let me get you guys onto my screen i 
Thank you guys for being patient. Bear with me. Got to start the broadcast. All right. So now you should be able to see my screen. Let me know if you can't. We're good. You guys see my screen? You guys seeing that first image? Yep. All right. So um, this, I wanted to start with this one because this was a new accomplishment for me. I've been wanting to combine both uh, broadband and narrowband data uh, together in a wide field state and then uh, ultimately uh, turn that into some sort of composite that I could factor in some sort of foreground. So I'm very, very big on this type of shooting. And if you notice, the Milky Way is actually filling uh, the frame or the sky a bit more. That's because I chose to go with a 50 millimeter lens to give me a bit more tighter crop, um, tighter view on the Milky Way, but also I'm shooting on a crop camera, so that puts me a bit further out into the sky. Um, another thing I should explain too, the reason why you're seeing so much detail is I'm using a tracking device, which allows me to slowly rotate and track the night sky to shoot longer exposure. So instead of me, for example, only being able to shoot 15, 20 seconds with example, a wide angle lens, um, now I can be uh, successfully tracking up to three to five minutes, given my polar alignment. Um, so it's a bit different from just your stationary camera and tripod setup. Um, I started with just doing single images and relying on the ISO capability or the low light capability of the camera. And as I started to become more and more of a pixel peeper, I started to become more and more frustrated with the amount of noise that I was getting over the detail that I was getting. So uh, I started to dive down the rabbit hole. Uh, I'm very much so a mechanical person, mechanical mind. I like working with my hands. So uh, down that rabbit hole, I took the time to uh, teach myself. Um, thankfully, there is a ton of great resources out there for free. A uh, quick shout out to Ian Norman of Lonely Spec photography he's from the west coast and he is the first youtuber slash astronomer slash night sky photographer list goes on um he was the first person that i took the time to really sit down and uh really learn from and um i don't regret it for a second uh he's taught me endless techniques on uh just stacking alone and as you can see from where that started years back, Scott mentioned that earlier in the video where I was still very new and then moving uh, past the point of pixel peeping and then uh, learning how to stack. Today, we bring you forward all the way to me using a portable tracking mount and combining two separate images to create one fantasy-like to some composite type image. Uh, so that's that. Oh, and I should note, this is uh, shot in uh, Connecticut. So there are some great spots along the coast of Connecticut, just the coast of New England in general, but specifically Connecticut, where I'm from. Um, the trouble is we're dealing with a lot of metropolitan light pollution sneaking in in the west from New York uh, to, to the right. We have some cities as well. Or excuse me, to the east, we have some cities as well. Um, so there's li these little pockets along the coast that you can find yourself in that are surprisingly dark. So I say it to say this, if you're in the Stonington Harbor area and you make it down to Stonington Lighthouse Point, uh, Dubois Beach is incredibly dark um, and definitely worth the night sky experience, especially this time of year where it's out over the Atlantic. Now, James, yep. you mentioned that you're shooting uh, narrowband. What does that mean? Uh, so narrowband uh, allows me to isolate uh, one specific wavelength uh, in our night skies. In this case, it's uh, hydrogen alpha or ionized uh, hydrogen. And um, this, me, me adding this data into my existing color data, which, we're, you know, which we can see with our naked eye, I'm getting a lot more impactful details, faint details that otherwise wouldn't be so... Um, easily pulled out in, uh, for example, an unmodified camera or a, even a modified camera that just really didn't have enough time soaked in on the sky. So as I start to get further into this, I realize the value of soaking up as much time as possible. And if that means adding in uh, specific filters such as narrow band, they're going to help me isolate these targets to further improve my end result. 
then so be it. Jessica has a question. Yes. Yeah. So James, Adam is asking, how do you go about polar aligning? Can you practice before going out to the field in the night? There is ways to polar align during the day. Um, I'm going to be 100% honest. I, I haven't personally um, had any experience with polar alignment during the day. But one thing I like to do is just get familiar with my gear, hands-on, uh, all the time, whether I can actively polar align or not. I just want to make that experience when I go out in the field on a night that really counts, um, and I can nail that. Um, and, of course, the polar alignment thing took endless nights of practice just to get it right. And I should know, as your focal length increases, that job of polar alignment gets even harder and harder. So um, the best way is to find Polaris, which the easiest way is off of the um, corner star in the Big Dipper. Um, you'll always find it there. Um, that's the easiest way. And I should I note as well, too, the wider that you're shooting, the more forgiving that your polar alignment will be. Thank you, James. Yeah, no problem at all. All right. So... Um, I'll go ahead and move on to the ne uh, next image. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, that image looks familiar. Is that what this, observatory is that? Yeah, <laughs> this is a very <laughs> awesome observatory where they do great uh, stargazing, stargazing events, uh, which is absolutely amazing. They have a great guy running it. Super informational. Has helped me from day one. I know the guy. His name's Scott. Um, no, <laughs> yeah, I've heard about him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is the, uh, an image that I put together from the other night during the Lyrid meteor shower when me and Scott were at the Frosty Drew Observatory. Um, this is just um, RGB data, so it's, it's, it's just color data. I didn't add any narrow band data to make this more impactful. Um, I just wanted to shoot unfiltered skies because whenever I'm here, uh, at Ninigrit Park or the Frosty Drew Observatory, the skies are just beautifully dark. I don't necessarily think I need uh, any sort of filtering, although sometimes for a certain projects, maybe longer focal lengths, I do get into that. But for the wide angle stuff and the location, I wanted to just be unfiltered. Now, Scott, I did notice that I didn't, I didn't end up compositing it back in. I should have. I thought about it at a later date, but I did get a Lyrid. Um, up towards the scutum um, section of the uh, Milky Way here. Awesome. And it shot down the side, and I noticed it after I had already put the images, uh, the images together. And I was like, you know what? This is just too satisfying the way it is. Let me just not mess with it. That um, happened to me. When I was digging through my data and put together the image, I almost released it. And then I was like, wait a minute. Let me see if I can find any Lyrids in the, in the original data sets. And I actually found a few. Yes, yes. That was actually super beautiful, too. You got some really uh, nice streakers there. James and I were, when we were out for the Lyrids, we experienced uh, uh, quite an increase in meteor activity, which is unexpected for the Lyrid meteor shower. We don't usually see a very large output in meteor activity during that shower. And I usually consider it one of the weaker showers of the year. And I'll often skip it, maybe because I'm a meteor snob. I don't know. But when we were out that night, <laughs> Like we just constantly, we were like, there's another one. There's another one. At, there were several times where we saw two meteors in the sky at once. It was really quite a fabulous night. And it seems like everyone else who went out for the Lyrids just didn't get the show that James and I got because I've heard people say, oh, yeah, I went out and see anything. Well, we saw a ton, dozens of them that night. Yeah, you know, I think it was such a, a sporadic, so to speak, type of meteor shower that if you weren't out there for a greater portion of the night, you might have missed that small fraction of time that they were going to appear. Right. Um, so let me see here, because um, I would really like to move here next. Um, this by far is, this image to me uh, is, um, I'm probably the most proud of this image here. Um, mainly because of everything that went in to, to get it. Now, give me wrong, or excuse me, don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of imperfection here, but it's a huge leap from where the image first started. So I wanted to show you guys that final, and I'm gonna talk more about it, but I wanna show you guys real quick at where it started, because um, I did um, have that as well, too. 
So this, this, this was before I even applied any HA data into it. Um, this was probably only about five to six hours in, um, really a fraction of time in terms of this section of sky when you're looking to pull out uh, IFN and other faint objects in the sky. Um, so we'll go back to the original one, but I just wanted to show you guys the leap there. And the difference was is five to six hours in that last image I just showed you guys. And this is a compilation of 24 hours between eight hours of RGB and six hours of HA. Um, the beauty of this is that we can keep adding to these targets as well. Um, I unfortunately don't have a go-to mount, so my, uh, my composition and framing changes a bit as far as in terms of uh, dither uh, dithering. That does help me. But, um, you know, everything is going to change. But I know at least next year I can continue to add into this project. And like I said, you're viewing it right now at 24 hours. I can only imagine when it would get to 100 hours. Now, this was shot over uh, a period of two and a half months, maybe three tops. And various locations went into it. I primarily shot a majority of the data from the Frosty Drew Observatory because it's a, just a great location where I could, it could be freezing outside. My camera can be suffering and I could be parked right there with my car running, staying warm. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. Huh. Um, but the winter provided a lot of clear weather as well this year too. So um, that was good. Um, but between fighting wind and not so great weather sometimes, um, this, this, this image finally came together. And uh, it, it took for me to sleep in the car and drive to Maine, and uh, which I, I, I don't ever mind doing, if you know me. Uh, I think Scott will attest to that. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, and just all of these other various dark sky spots, just to try to bring this image together. So I'm um, very proud of it, and I'm very excited to shoot more targets um, and add a good amount of time and, in the future, add more to this as well. So um, Now, this is a fabulous image, but what part of the sky are we looking at here? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, let that part out. So this is um, the Orion constellation. And you're seeing right dead center is three belt stars. Um, and you see almost like a half of circle of red. That looping red there is Barnard's loop. And if I zoom in on the image, do you guys see it change? Yep. OK, cool. So I can do that to kind of like separate so you don't know where to look in the image. So right here uh, in, the right. in the center of the zoom right now is the Orion Nebula, um, which is the bigger one of the two there. And the smaller one, uh, I would say slightly up into the left of that, is the Running Man Nebula. Uh, and as we slide over here, you can actually see some of the, the belt stars. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the last belt star here next to these two nebulas is Altanac. Alan attack. Alan attack. There you go. Um, okay. So uh, that bright star there, we got two nebulas. Oh, it looks like I can't zoom in any further there. But um, to the left of that star is the flame nebula. Um, to the right of that star is the horsehead nebula. So a ton of ionized hydrogen in this section of the sky. This is a winter constellation. Um, so we start to see it. Um, what do you say, Scott? Maybe November to February, maybe a bit later? Yeah, it depends how late you're out. I mean, I start seeing Orion in the morning hours in August. But if you want to see it kind of prime time or in the evening, usually late November is when it starts to become very visible. And it will stick around until you know, early March before you start losing it earlier in the night. Ah. And Orion is definitely one of the most discernible constellations in the sky. I mean, everyone sees Orion's belt. Everyone asks about Orion's belt. But, I mean, this image is fabulous, James. And that, I mean, th your capture of Barnard's loop, which is that really large red arc that James was pointing out earlier. I mean, this is a, this is a remnant of a supernova that occurred in this area of the sky. And that, the Orion Nebula, which James was pointing out before, that's the closest site of massive star formation to the solar system. I mean, it's 1,400 light years distant, 
And there is stars forming in that nebula today. I mean, it is a stellar nursery. And this image just shows a fantastic view of the much larger region called the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex, which the Orion Nebula, the Flame Nebula, Barnard's Loop, the Horsehead Nebula are all part of. Mm. Super bright, super bright, super beautiful. And um, I did just real quick, just to show people, I put together a small map just so you can uh, visualize um, some of the items in this section of the sky or some of the objects in this section of the sky that I was uh, referring to, which a couple I didn't get to mention as well too, but if you're unfamiliar with this part of the sky, just kind of quick little label on that for you. Hey James, sorry to interrupt, but yes. uh, just a quick question. Oscar wanted to know if you've been able to photograph any, uh, any planets and if you have, what's your favorite one to photograph? Uh, you know what the because I lack um, uh, equipment here and I'm very limited. Uh, the most um, that I've been able to capture is 200 millimeters on Venus when it was neighboring Pleiades. Um, you know what I never got around to processing those images. I wish I could show you that, um, but not in great detail like you would see um, from some of these setups or excuse me some of these planetary setups. It is just mind blowing some of the detail that they're getting from these planet surfaces. Thank now, you. James, you mentioned that you have, you haven't gotten around to processing those data sets yet. How many, how many data sets do you have sitting on your drive that are not processed yet? Uh, you know what? I'm working on row, row up, 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 I, I can never say that right. Um, that is something that I'm working on right now. I'm at probably an effective five hours. I'm trying to gather as much as 24 uh, being ambitious, but, you know, maybe 10 before I provide some sort of pre preview, you know, for people to see. Mm -hmm. um, but I kind of store everything on an external hard drive um, as far as all the data sets. And uh, I know that just in the back of my mind, I could always add to them. But as far as unprocessed stuff gets like I'm, super ambitious and just relentless sometimes i won't let myself sleep sometimes i won't let myself wake up in the morning until i'm like on that and getting stuff going because i'm very limited as far as processing um capabilities go so sometimes um if i want to stack an image of 100 images it's going to take you know sometimes all day so right um so, so i'm sorry go ahead we have so some people are asking to see the rings of Saturn. Would it be okay if I throw a picture up real quick of that, James? Oh, absolutely. Do you need me to stop sharing my screen? I might be able to boot you off. Let me see. Okay. You're cool with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to Shanghai James' this thing real quick here. So, and then we'll hand it right back over to James in a moment. So I'm back in with you guys. Yeah. Than that. All right, so here we go. So there was a question about the rings of Saturn and some planetary imaging. So here is an image of Saturn that we had captured Ooh. at the observatory in 2000 and I think this is 2017, what we're looking at right here. And what you have in this image here, so you have all these different lines you see on Saturn here. These are called the equatorial bands. And what you're looking at are just different parts of that upper cloud deck that surrounds Saturn. It's largely made up of ammonia and water vapor. And underneath that cloud deck is largely hydrogen. In the rings out here, you can notice that there are definitely different lines in the rings. This dark band that goes around here is called the Cassini division. And the Cassini division is a gap in the rings that is formed by Saturn's moon Mimas. As Mimas orbits Saturn, the particulates in Saturn's rings in that position, they orbit at twice or two times for every one time that Mimas orbits. And when that happens, they start to pull. Mimas' gravity pulls on the part of particulates as they approach and they speed up. And then as they pass Mimas, they slow down. And this is called a stable resonance. And in doing so, they move a little bit forward and it clears out that portion of the rings. Now, here is another quick image 
of Saturn. And this is what one of the things we've been doing over the last few years at Frosty Drew. Oh. We catalog Saturn's tilt changes. Now, if you think about Saturn, Saturn takes about 30 years to get around the sun, so 30 Earth years. And Saturn's tilted 26.7 degrees on its axis, so it's got a nice tilt to it. Now, its tilt doesn't change, but as it goes around the sun in 30-year periods, we catch up to it. And every year when we catch up to it, we see the rings at a different tilt based on our vantage point or our viewing angle. And that causes Saturn's rings to appear to change their tilt for us every year a little bit. Now, in May 2017, that was Saturn's summer solstice. And that was when Saturn's rings were tilted at maximum 26.7 degrees towards the sun and consequently towards us. Over the next few years, we're going to see Saturn's rings get thinner and thinner and thinner. And then eventually, Saturn's rings in about another four years will be on edge. And it will look like Saturn has just a thin line that goes across the center and almost has no rings for that year. Now, I am going to turn this back over to James. Thank you, James. No problem. Can I just say that those images were amazing, by the way? Oh, thanks. thanks. Thank you. I'm, I'm loving your stuff, too. Your stuff is just, it's so beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, all right. So let me get back to the screen broadcast in here, guys. Um, jump in back to the photos. Um, so this is uh, just an example of a uh, wide field um, HA image or hydrogen alpha image. Um, and it was actually shot um, a little later in the season. So this is uh, the Cygnus and Saturn region of the Milky Way. Um, so you got a lot going on here um, as far as nebulosity goes. Um, and again, it was uh, a little late in the season. So um, Scott can attest to this. The Milky Way um, actually ends up over uh, westerly um, that time of the year. So I actually had to deal with a little bit of light pollution, but also some uh, background neutralization uh, in order to get this uh the, the gradient here off of the bottom of the image. And if I'm not mistaken, I can actually show you the glow that I was actually dealing with. So before I, I, I uh, neutralized my background, um, you, you, can actually, you can actually obviously see how bad the light pollution was there. And then after some stretching, um, levels, curves, stuff like that, um, and neutralizing the background, I was able to pull out a lot more of that detail that's there. Um, so much so that even though it's a wide field, you can see the crescent nebula there. Oh, fabulous. It, it, uh, that one to me looks like a little brain. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we also have the butterfly nebula um, here as well. And then uh, we have the North American and the Pelican nebula, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, all right, so uh, th that's that. And that is just, if I'm not mistaken, that is less than an hour worth of hydrogen alpha, too. So you can imagine how it would look if you were to gather, you know, anywhere from five to ten hours. Um, but I should note as well, too, using a tracking device makes it a lot easier for me to collect a lot more time on these objects um, than if I were to be only shooting 15 to 20 seconds, I can shoot uh, three minutes at a time. I don't really like to push it more than that with my tracking mount. It's, it's not the best, but um, definitely helps get the job done. And as long as I stay within that uh, limit, um, then I am okay. Um, so I was going to switch. I'm sorry, go ahead. You mentioned that, you know, the, between those two images, the, the light pollution was significant in one of them and the other one wasn't there. Do you have a trick for removing light pollution from images? Is it something you do in the field or is it only something you can do in post-processing? So it, it's um, in the field, I can imagine the only way that you would possibly be able to do that is with some sort of didymium, some sort of light pollution filter that's gonna really cut down that glow. But I would say a uh, greater majority of the neutralization is coming from post-processing, which I'm doing in Photoshop. Um, shout out to Chuck's Astrophotography. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody in here is familiar with him. Um, I believe he's from the Detroit, Michigan area. But he um, covered a great way to neutralize your background 
in uh, Photoshop. Um, you can find that video on YouTube. Again, that's Chuck's Astro Photography. Uh, very nice guy. Very, uh, very um, informative and very easy to learn from. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're using the sampling tool, the color sampling tool in Photoshop to sample the corners of your image. And I can imagine um, it's evaluating the colors in every part of the image or the pixels in every part of the image. And from there, basically I'm copying that image. Once I have those values, I can copy it onto a new canvas. And then I'm using a filter called Gaussian blur to remove all of the detail and all of the stars. And then I'm bringing um, that image back into the other image by applying the image to it. But instead of me just uh, applying it and, you know, using the drop down blending modes to change something, I'm actually um, applying the image and using a method of, uh, of uh, subtraction from the image. So I'm actually subtracting that gradient from the image. Um, it's a bit aggressive at first, but um, when you're working on copies and you work, uh, if you're familiar with opacity, um, then you can really like threshold your effects to make them not as harsh or overwhelming to the eye. Fantastic. Um, so I wanted to switch it up with the next image. Um, and I don't do a ton of moon photography um, as much as I should. Um, again, I'm kind of lacking in that field as far as uh, focal length. But um, something that's always marveled me about the uh, winters uh, here in New England or I guess wherever you can get cold weather and you can have this phenomenon happen. But one thing that always marveled me about, you know, night skies in the winter was the possibility for some sort of moon halo. And if I'm not mistaken, maybe Scott can give you a better description here, but it's ice crystals in the atmosphere that are illuminated by the moon. Yeah, for the most part, you're looking at hexagonal shaped ice crystals. They're very small and they're aligned. And what they do is when the light refracts once on the way in and then again on the way out on different angles and all the light is spread away from the viewer's vantage point to about wow. 22 degrees in radius from the light source. And it gives you that ring. So, yeah, you're right. It's ice crystals in, in, the, in the atmosphere. Wow. What? No, that's that's really cool to hear it more in depth like that. So whenever I can uh, get outside um, on a, you know, on otherwise not a clear night, which is very rare. If I know it's not going to be clear, generally speaking, I'm in the house processing, maybe shooting during the day and that's it for me. But sometimes I like to go out um, and I like to photograph the moon every once in a while. But, I, you know, ever since I caught my first moon halo about three or four years ago, I've always been kind of just trying to keep an eye out for it because it is just a phenomenal thing to see. And I was able to, it's, it's not the greatest image here. I had to deal with field distortion, which made the pano stitching um, a bit more tricky, but Photoshop did overall a great job uh, and I was satisfied. But so I was able to take a series of panoramic, uh, excuse me, um, horizontal images to create this panoramic image i believe it was uh anywhere from four to five images and i just shot from the bottom all the way up because i knew i wanted to catch the reflection of the moon halo but also the moon halo in the sky and i just didn't quite have the lens uh or a wide enough lens to do so um, now is this shot in connecticut Oh, yes. I'm sorry. That was uh, shot at the Fort Rachel Marina uh, right in Mystic, Connecticut. So if you're familiar with the Mystic area, it's right around the corner from uh, Margarita's DPI. Now, when, you guys are sh when you're shooting the moon like this, I notice that the moon is really bright. But when you look at the sky with a halo, you can see detail in the moon as well with your eyes. Why does the camera have so much trouble capturing detail on the moon and the halo at the same time? Well, I would say right off the bat, dynamic range is a, is, a, is a very tough range for a lot of cameras to achieve. You have really bright highlights, a really uh, under clip shadows. It's tough to get a mixture of the both. And in order for me to get the detail in the foreground, 
uh, like I wanted to, I knew I would need to shoot um, a little bit longer of a shutter speed um, to collect a little bit more ambient light around me to maybe introduce a bit more foreground into the image. Now doing so, um, I'm sacrificing the highlights and the moon surface and I'm actually blowing it out. So theoretically, um, you could composite this image even further um, and maybe even get surface details of the moon and then add it over and try to maybe make that transition between the uh, highlights or the halos around the edge of it um, into a um, detailed surface moon and the halo and the foreground. That's a being, being a bit ambitious, but, you know, if you were to take the time, you could, you could definitely make that happen. That'd be like an HDR image, right? Right, exactly. Um, that's, a, so, that's a beautiful picture. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so here's one. I've been trying to dive a bit more with the Orion. After the accomplishment of the Orion project, uh, I wanted to dive in a bit more to um, more night sky objects um, that weren't necessarily easily viewed um, by the eye or, or easily captured. So uh, one I had my heart set on, no pun intended, is the uh, Heart in the Soul Nebula, um, which on the very tip here, I believe, is the Fish Head Nebula, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm very proud of this image. This image was actually captured over a series of nights, again, at the Frosty Drew Observatory. And it is a combination of color data and, or should I say, broadband and narrowband data. So color and uh, H-alpha. Uh, combined together and uh, it's not a ton of time on it I believe it's uh, only four hours total um, but I was very proud of this image mainly because I had captured what I really wanted to capture um, and I was able to pull out um, a lot of the um, hydrogen detail but also that 80, 80 to two excuse me 80 to 200 millimeter that I was briefly talking to you guys about uh, earlier in this chat um, I actually purchased that f for 30 bucks and the lens I believe was made in 1985. So, um, I'm a firm believer of just making do of what you have. I love spending money on really fancy gear and stuff like that. But if I can Frankenstein and have fun and, um, hybrid, you know, at a cheap rate, I'll, you know, take the time and just play around and see what I can get. And, uh, should I say, this lens for its price point and its age just absolutely surprised me on the star shape. Uh, granted, adding in the narrow band data did shrink down a lot of the, the star shape just in general. But um, to see nice round stars from a lens from the 80s was pretty mind blowing. Um, so let's see what else we got here for you guys. Uh, any questions or anything before I... Building out those, <clears throat> okay, like your camera and stuff like that. That's that's a really great thing. I mean, you figure you're, you, what you're doing is creativity. It's art, and why stop with just the images? I mean, if you can get creative and crafty with your lenses, with your setup, with your camera, it's just gonna it's gonna just boost your end result so much more. Right, right, and just constantly like continue to inspire me. Like I'm. Um constantly inspired by just sitting down planning something out and just trying it whether i succeed or fail and i think the failure makes you want it more yeah i mean you know, uh, the day without failing is a day without learning right right exactly and uh, you know that's i think what has gotten me to this point is i just relentlessly relentlessly was unafraid to um fail um and just over and over again, just repetitiously. And I just like anything, um, you'll eventually get it. And, um, just so happens to be, you know, something that I'm extremely passionate about. And maybe I'm diving down the rabbit hole here. I, be I believe a greater part of our existence is connected to these objects in our night sky. So what, what better passion to have, right? Right, right. Absolutely. Um, so moving on, uh, as far as images go, uh, another composite as well. I'm very big on this and, um, I fell in love quickly with the tighter focal length and the wider foreground. Um, so this is an 
an extremely dark area in Rhode Island um, called Sakonet Point. It's in Little Compton, Rhode Island. And it is uh, a nice long beach with a point. They got a lighthouse there, but the night skies are unbelievably dark there. Equal, equal to uh, the Frosty Drew, hands down. Um, nice. So again, just only broad ba- uh, broadband RGB data here. Nothing crazy. Uh, I got about two hours worth of uh, exposure on the sky. So I was able to pull out a lot of great targets here. You got the uh, Triffids there. You got the Lagoon uh, here at the bottom. And if I'm not mistaken, it almost looks like a tail of nebulosity, red nebulosity next to the Lagoon. Um, and uh, that is IC4678. Okay. Uh, I, I, I could be wrong there, um, but I'm, I'm trying to pick up on the uh, targets in that area just so I can uh, be a bit more fam- uh, familiar with those. And then you have the two nebulas up here, the Eagle and the Omega Nebula. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's see here. Can show you guys this one too as well. Um, this is another winter target that I, I I'm super um, proud of as well too. It was a really tough one to pull out, but again, I was able to combine the uh, two types of data to get a bit more detail in this section of the sky. Again, this was photographed at the Frosty Drew Observatory um, in Charlestown, Rhode Island, and uh, we have the Rosette Nebula here in pretty good detail. Again, this was shot on my 50 millimeter lens, so uh, it's my go-to a lot of the time. Uh, man, for its price point, um, the quality is just unbeatable. Uh, then we, then we have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is the Fox Fur Nebula over over here, and you also have the Cone Nebula, Scott. If I'm not mistaken, that's right. And I believe there's a Christmas tree cluster in there. If I'm not yeah. mistaken. Okay. All right. Um, so we got that. Um, let's see. I can give you guys. This is, uh, I didn't get much time on this one at all, but it was just something new I wanted to point and uh, just try to grab something else new. Um, this, I believe, is the Crab Nebula. And again, it's not compromised of a bunch of time, but again, with that lens shooting wide open. Uh, I was pretty surprised. You have some halo, some aberration, coma, and stuff like that. But for its age, um, I was blown away. Absolutely blown away. Um, let's see here. Oh, sorry, guys. That's from Instagram. Uh, we've got another um, HA image here. And a bit more concentrated on some of the areas that I was showing you guys before. Uh, we'll start with the left side of the image. We have the... Uh, flame and the horsehead nebula, um, which is in actually pretty good detail. Oh yeah, the horsehead looks great there. Yeah, uh, the 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 HA um, is it just adds dramatic contrast to the overall image. Um, and then on this side, um, you can see the um, Orion nebula and then the Running Man nebula, and also in pretty good detail too. Also, not a bunch of time on this part of the sky. Using this lens, I think I just wanted to try something new. Um, but I was very excited with the limited amount of time and all the faint wispiness uh, of the nebulosity. Now that we're getting into, you know, s- mid-spring right now, we're definitely getting into, like, Milky Way viewing season. Yes. Um, yes. The, we, we, are, we are moving into prime time Milky Way season um, or galaxy season. Um, and, um, it's, I would say, uh, hands down some of the best time to shoot, uh, move from the start of spring as we move into summer. Uh, it's some of the best time to photograph the night sky or the Milky Way specifically, because you have it out, at least for where we're positioned, you have it out over the Atlantic ocean and you don't have much obstruction of light other than the small islands out there so you get great views and dramatic detail in some of the uh objects in the center of the galaxy there Mm -hmm. yeah james there was a question here from adam he said are you using two different lenses in one setup to capture your foreground and background for your milky way shots 
Uh, yes, I am. Um, a lot of the times for my foreground, I'm using a wide angle lens um, and I'm capturing the sky separately uh, with a 50 millimeter lens. That seems to be my go to. Uh, but sometimes I'm just in the mood for some wide field sky as well, too. So I will just grab uh, the foreground with a 16 and then I'll grab the sky with a 16. So I'm getting more of the Milky Way arch. Oh. Yeah, no problem. So th this image is a uh, composite as well, too. Um, if you've ever been to the Nubble Lighthouse um, and you've ever shot that landscape, it's a beautiful landscape, how this lighthouse just sits up on this rock island. But it has very pesky power lines that are supplying power to it. So conceptually, I was thinking it would probably be best for me to remove these distracting power lines that also might make my masking job um, a bit harder. Now, masking is what I'm doing to bring these two images together. Um, so two separate layers. And um, basically, the easiest way to explain it is painting in my sky and then painting in my foreground or vice versa. It could go either which way. Um, and I shot um, the sky at a separate location. So sometimes it doesn't always happen at the same location. Um, with this uh, location specifically, I had to deal with cars coming in and out, in and out, in and out. So what I actually did was I, when I originally shot the, uh, the foreground, I was uh, in love of, with the colors, the natural night colors. But I wasn't happy with the amount of cars that were pulling up to the spot with their headlights on and just blasting the side of that rock. So what I did is I chose to go up uh, to a nearby spot called Mount Modidnock. I think I'm saying that right. And it's, it's a nice overlook about 15, 20 minutes away. And it just overlooks the area and you have a lot less traffic. And then what I did is after I was able to com uh, basically compose the sky and get the shots what I, what I needed there, I went back down to the lighthouse as the morning started to roll in. So that's why it appears to have a blue tint. And when you have reflective surfaces such as water, it's very revealing when you're trying to uh, make a composite, like a twilight, blue hour type of composite. So it really takes a lot of experience um, adjusting your color to make it more natural. But there is benefits to shooting like that. Again, I didn't have to deal with the headlights of the cars, but also I have greater shadow detail as well in my foregrounds, which otherwise may have been a bit more difficult to get. I like to shoot longer exposures, um, which can still introduce noise. High ISO will get you the shadow detail, but with the sacrifice of your detail, you get more noise. Um, so there's a couple different techniques I like to do uh, every once in a while, this being one of them, the twilight, our blue hour type of composite. And then I just went in through the sky, the finished sky over it. And, um, uh, not a lot of time on the sky, so pardon the grain here, but if you're seeing some familiar targets from earlier in this session, um, it's because it's just a wider view of those objects. Um, you can still see Barnard's Loop. You can see uh, the Horsehead Nebula, um, the Flame, the Running Man, the Orion Nebula. You can see the Garnet, uh, Garnet Star, Garnet Nebula. You can see the Rosette and the Fox and the cone nebulas as well. So our winter skies are uh, just, I mean, I'm sure you guys can attest to this, are just as good as the summer skies, but the summer skies just have large, bright objects in it. I guess really depending on your focal length, if you can get out into the sky, then you have no problem getting some of these objects. But I would say they're both equally um, great times of year to shoot. Now, which lighthouse is this? Uh, so this is the Nubble Lighthouse in uh, York, Maine. Oh. Now, is, this, is this by like Arcadia or is this further north than that? This is uh, a bit more uh, west of Acadia. So you probably would only have to drive about three or four hours relatively. Come where I'm from. I'm in southeastern Connecticut. But uh, around three or four hours to get to this spot versus Acadia is close to seven hours by the time you get to, out to some of the harbors and stuff. Um, so let's see what else hey, I got here for you. Hey. Yeah. Real quick, um, uh, 
Some want to know how clear the Milky Way is from Frosty Drew Observatory. Um, apparently they've been and they haven't seen it, they said. Um, so it is extremely clear. And that that goes with saying that, you know, uh, you, you do have to allow your eyes to adjust. As the Milky Way starts to rise into the sky um, and out of the atmospheric distortion, it seems to almost get brighter, but maybe I would say gaining more co contrast and clarity. And you really need good sky conditions. If your seeing or transparency conditions are slightly altered at all, it is going to alter your view of these otherwise faint objects. The Milky Way being appearing as a milky type of cl cloud in the sky, it's, it's, it's not to say that it's super bright, but it's also not incredibly dim either yeah the the it, it's really important to note that what james was saying that you need to let your eyes become adapted to to, to, to the darkness dark sky adaption so we we often recommend that our visitors at frosty drew when they arrive especially on a really great night when the milky way is quite visible is to turn off their car turn off their phone and sit in the car for about 10 minutes and let your eyes become adapted to the dark. There's a couple of reasons. One, you're gonna see a lot more in the sky, but you're also gonna see a lot more on the ground and you have less of a chance of tripping over something or less of a chance of feeling like you need to use a flashlight to move around. Because if you're using a flashlight that's not red, then you're not gonna become dark sky adapted and you're gonna miss out on things like the Milky Way. But another important thing to note too about the Milky Way is you're not gonna see the Milky Way if it's a, if the moon is up. The moon is super bright. It brightens up the atmosphere in the sky to the point where the Milky Way becomes dimmer than the atmosphere is, so we miss out on it. And it's almost a similar effect to the way light pollution affects your view. In this case, it's more natural. So there's, if you're not seeing the Milky Way at Frosty Drew at times, it's because you either, you, you could have came when the moon was up, you may not be a dark guy adapted, or it just could have been a hazy night. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, so, and then, like Scott was saying, there's a lot of things that are factored in. So uh, I would say don't give up and definitely get back out there because it is an incredible place to be, especially on a Friday night when you have in extremely informative, informational people that are pointing out different objects in the sky and just getting you familiar with our night sky. So let's see some of those. You got some really great, Milky Way pictures, James. And tonight when we we put out the notification about tonight's event, we used one of your images with the Milky Way rising. It looks like it's over maybe East Beach and you're standing in it. And oh. I, I don't know if you could talk a little bit more about some of the Milky Way pictures and the Milky Way shots that you've done over the years. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so, I, I mean, I, it has drawn a crazy amount of my interest just in general um i'm just awed by the milky way um and it started um way back um with just um really simple equipment um not even 100 percent even understanding what i'm shooting i was just awed i guess by the night sky in general and as i started to take more interest i started to learn about different objects in the sky and one of the Big, bigger and brighter ones you know, being the center of our galaxy and all the items that are contained within it. Um, so, I mean, that, that just continued on and on and on. And uh, I just became more and more ambitious, looking for new compositions, looking for new techniques to shoot, looking for new techniques to process my image to end up with more detail than I have noise. Um, all, all, all of that was just a endless, relentless, oh, it's still ongoing journey um, of, you know, night sky shooting and learning and like uh, just comprehending because there's a lot that goes into it. I mean, uh, you essentially teach yourself the weather through doing this um, and you learn how much that plays into it and how much that can affect, um, you know, your end result um, and just some of the conditions that you have to shoot through. Some areas are le more or less favorable than others. 
Um, also, uh, what is it? The light pollution that you have to deal with, um, you know, can greatly impact uh, a, a lot of the detail in your image. So what we may sometimes take for granted uh, being here along the coast, somebody closer to the city uh, or other metropolitan areas are barely seeing anything in their night sky. I mean, in the center of some of that is um, just nothing. You don't see any stars. You might just see building lights. That's it. And that's really uh, depressing because, again, going back to, you know, the connection that I believe in that we have with the, with the stars. I mean, I can't be alone on this here. I feel like that plays a, 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 a great, a greater, a great part in the balance of our every day. You know, if we allow ourselves that uh, night sky experience or just nature in general, just stepping outside of our door, I believe the, the connection goes much deeper and is much greater than uh, the surface. Um, so this, doing this, I say it to say this, uh, and I'm hoping I, I'm got, not going too far down the rabbit hole here, but I say it to say this, that, um, you know, uh, constantly doing that has changed my mind on so many things. And I think that it is inspiring to so many people because of what can be uh, achieved. Like when you go out there, minus the camera. I mean, we learn so much about ourselves. We learn so much about our night sky, about our thoughts, our ideas, and um, so many other things like that may be hard to fathom for others can be achieved in a, in a thinking state when you're, when you're out in nature, when you're out under the stars and stuff like that. So granted, there's a, there's a lot of uh, photographing and stuff that goes into it. But what Scott was mentioning earlier in the chat about uh, my attitude on certain things, it, a, a greater part of that comes from that relentless connection that I allow into my life from, uh, specifically in this case, night skies, but overall nature in general, whether it's just getting out, being out, the whole experience in itself. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'm sure all the fellas in here can attest to this one, but you have to go through like the frustrated, aggravated state of things to come out on the other side of things and look back and be able to laugh at that. And I can't tell you how many countless nights I spent frustrated not being able to get what I want, not being able to get polar aligned. I mean, that's a bit more present, but, you know, back thinking that the weather, I controlled the weather and because the weather didn't work out for me, everything else is a wreck. And that's not the way to think, but you, you, you have to experience it and force yourself out there to work through these, these, uh, these roadblocks, so to speak hurdles, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I got, I got a dent in my tripod leg for every night that went wrong. <laughs> and yeah. there's been numerous times that I've just left my gear outside and, and it's like, you're spending the night out here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now the, Jess has a question, I think. Yes. Yeah, there's actually a few that have come in. Um, Ken had asked uh, what the best time of year is to see the Milky Way. Uh, I, I would say the, the best time of the year to see the Milky Way is probably going to be April through August. Um, September, maybe, you know, given that. But uh, you can view it as early as 4 a.m. Uh, on, uh, in, excuse me, in February and then shoot it as late as November, depending on your position in the U.S. If you go further west, I can imagine once you escape a lot of the metropolitan light, you can still catch some pretty good details around that time of year. And just the other night, James and I were, were talking about times of the year to see the Milky Way. And at Frosty Drew, we really don't start getting excited about the Milky Way until around now, like mid-April. But James and some of the other night photographers in the area, they're out there in the middle of the winter <laughs> photographing the Milky Way. And James was talking about how they... They hike out into these remote locations because you need that super low horizon view and they're freezing to get all their gear set up to see the Milky Way for about five minutes before sunrise comes in and washes it out. Yep. Yeah. That's love right there. Yeah. There's also, I mean, the, the Milky Way goes, you know, the, primarily the pictures that uh, we've been seeing tonight are looking at the southern Milky Way. The Milky right. Way is 
also present in the north. It's just much, much fainter. Right. Uh, and there's been a couple of photographers that I follow out of New Hampshire. I can't think of any of their names that will shoot the northern Milky Way um, because they have the dark skies to the north uh, to enable that. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, it goes that right through Cassiopeia. Yeah. Um, so let me see here. You can actually see uh, the winter Milky Way, uh, the northern region here. Yep. yep. Orion's right next to the Milky Way, and, a lot, uh, and most people don't realize it because the, the Milky Way is so faint uh, it, looking towards the, the northern part of the Milky Way. I and guess it, you want to think about it is that when, when you're in the, in the summertime, the night side of Earth faces the center of the galaxy, the galactic nucleus, like you see in this image here. But during the wintertime, the night side of Earth is orientated to face away from the galactic center. And we look at what's called the Perseus arm, which is the outer arm of the Milky Way galaxy, and then just dark space beyond it. So though it is visible and it is present, it's much dimmer and doesn't have as many features as we see when we look towards the galactic nucleus. Because in that view, like you see in this image here, you have the, the bright bulge and you have all those dust lanes. That's all we are looking at is all cold hydrogen gas. And when you look at the central region, which you can easily see by the brightest part of the Milky Way, it has a dark area that kind of cuts right across the center of it from left to right. And what you're looking at is the Scudum Centaurus arm of the Milky Way galaxy, which resides in between us and the galactic nucleus. And it kind of blocks some of our view. So you're getting a substantially larger amount of objects and billions of more stars in your view in the summertime than you do when you're looking at it in the winter. So yes. Michael, and then Michael Kota had another question, um, kind of, if not already covered, he said, I'd be interested to hear how the shot of James watching the Milky Way that you used to advertise this event was created, in particular his silhouette. So James, I have that image here if you want me to throw it up. Yes, please, let me get out of here real quick. All right. All right, here we go. All right. Yeah, this is, um, I believe this I shot um, because the green tint, the green tint uh, reminds me of the, uh, the days of the um, Hoya red intensifier filter. Um, I seem to get this cyan blue cast that uh, now <laughs> I'm not so much a fan of, but it's still a great image. Um, thank you guys so much for sharing this uh, right off rip. So um, how this image was composed, again, it's a composite. And that's how I'm making these images seem so perfect. Because um, to get everything in one shot, a lot of the time is um, pretty hard. And uh, I should note real quick, um, if, if, if people haven't noticed in the top right frame um, is actually a meteor that I added back into the frame. So I had that streak across the frame and I figured that'd be uh, a great way to take the composite a bit further. So what I did was I took a long exposure for the foreground. For example, normally I like to do up to six minutes at F4 ISO 400. Try to keep the ISO low. That way the uh, noise overall is relatively low and I'm getting a great amount of detail. In the silhouette, I actually had to shoot a whole separate shot for because I knew I wasn't going to be able to stand still long enough, especially not for six minutes. So basically, I, I had to shoot a separate 15 second image of just me standing in that one spot and then Photoshop myself back in there. And now the sky was actually, uh, when we had Venus there shining bright in, in the center of the galaxy, um, I actually shot the sky completely separately. For blending purposes, I like to shoot completely wide open skies. That means no foreground elements at all because it makes my masking job that much easier. Now, the, so when you did the silhouette, did you set a timer on your camera and then kind of run up on the dune? Or did you just keep firing off shots until you got into the place you wanted to be? 
I'm sorry. Um, uh, right. Um, let me let me just say this too. Um, I actually made a mistake. That's not Venus. That's Jupiter there, rising with the early Milky Way. Sorry about that. Um, and what I was allowed to do is because I had a remote um, hooked up to the camera, I was able to set a, a long delay or however long of a delay that I wanted to. So I gave myself about sixty seconds, maybe less, to walk over there, stand in position, sit there, and wait until the shot got captured. And I actually sat there for a couple of shots just to make sure in case I was moving, I moved my arm or something, um, that I could kind of mitigate that motion as best as possible. Then for, uh, in post-processing, um, I actually like, in, like to darken myself a bit more because when you darken yourself, you're actually hiding a bit of that blur. So with the black hard brush, I was able to kind of make my silhouette appear a bit more sharp as well too. So... It's a composite in every single sense of the word, but uh, you can achieve great things, you know. I think it's funny that you, you mentioned how you don't, you don't like the way certain aspects of this image may have came out, but this image is a fabulous image. And every Thank time you. we've used it for advertising, people are always like, what is that? <laughs> That's unbelievable. Oh, so, thank you. I think it's an interesting point of view how subjective a oh. photographer gets about their work. Oh, I'm so hard on myself. I, I believe as humans, we're our own worst critics. Um, and I'm constantly um, looking to improve color correction um, as far as post-processing goes. But, I mean, improving as a human in general. But specifically speaking with color correction in my images, um, I'm always looking to improve the color. It's always a, a battle. Now, where is this located at? So this is actually East Beach, which is actually 10 minutes, maybe less, from uh, Ninigret Park, Frosty Drew Observatory. And uh, it's in Charlestown, Rhode Island. It's a long stretch of beach with beautiful landscape. Uh, they have sand trails if you have uh, four by four. And uh, I should note, you do need a permit to drive on the beach. We don't want anybody driving on the beach. But if you have four by four and uh, are permitted to be on the beach, you can actually drive down the beach. But it's the most surreal uh, mixture of landscapes that I've seen. You have the small dunes, which I was standing on. Sorry, dune. Uh, you have the open beach, the, um, the seashore. And then you have these small, maybe 8 to 10 foot pine trees that line these sand trails. It is just some of the coolest clash of landscapes. So you're not seeing that in this foreground. You're seeing one of the runways out to the beach with the wooden fence. But short, uh, in a short walk to the left of where I'm standing in this image, you can actually make it into the sand trails, which it is beautiful landscape, beautiful. All right, I am going to relinquish the presentation now. There we go. So let's see hey, if I got... Scott. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth would like to know what the difference is between a nebula and a galaxy. So a, that's, a, that's a great question, Kenneth, because for a while we thought that galaxies were nebula. And a lot of times when you look at old star charts, you'll see like the Andromeda galaxy, but it will be listed as the Andromeda nebula. So a nebula is a cloud of usually hydrogen gas that resides inside the galaxy. And... It's where star formation happens. It's also where you, also, you get nebulae from stars that are dying as well. But these are all objects that are inside the galaxy, and they're what, part of what makes up a galaxy. Now, a galaxy itself is everything that we see in the sky. It's stars. It's nebulae. It's interstellar dust. It's white dwarfs or remnants of stars, supernova remnants, all of that. And they all hope they all kind of end up around a very intense, very large black hole in the center. So a good way to think about it is stars form a nebulae and nebulae and stars exist in galaxies. So let's do this. Let's switch over a little bit to some of our other team members and show some images from this past week and 
and from maybe a little bit earlier in the year. And then we'll jump back to James in a little bit. How does that sound? You good with that, James? James will be right back. All right. So, Derek, you want, hey. you want to take over? Uh, yeah, we can give it a whirl. Let's see if things work out today. Let's see here. A window. Hey, all right. So I'm going to start with a picture that's similar to some of the ones that um, James has been taking and showing us. Um, it's a shot of the Milky Way, but it's a little bit more natural color. Um, so right there, you're looking at the basically the brightest part of the Milky Way. Um, this was probably shot with about 135 millimeter lens uh, on a, an SLR style camera using a tracking mount that um, has been talked about tonight. Uh, right in the middle, there's kind of a bright nebula. Um, I don't know. Let's see if I can. I don't think you can see the mouse. So, um, and then above and to the right of it, there's a um, another nebula, which is the Trifid Nebula. And those two nebula are actually naked eye visible in the summer when you look towards the constellation Sagittarius, uh, which is uh, one of the constellations that we see from Frosty Drew when you look um, towards the southern horizon in the summer. And it sets, it's only up for a couple months out of the year and then it sets, but in the in the Sagittarius um, constellation is the center of our galaxy, uh, Sagittarius A. Um, and that's you know, kind of the galactic core uh, that Scott talked about earlier. Um, so from there, uh, we're going to jump over to some much narrower pictures. This image uh, here, though, is it, that's largely the, the entire galactic nucleus right there. Yeah. And when you're looking at this galactic nucleus, like Derek's composition is really great here because you can get that three-dimensional type perspective where that dark dust you see, all of that wispiness, that darkness, that's a lot closer to us than the actual galactic nucleus is, which is all that bright yellow in the background. And that bright yellow you're looking at is a concentration of billions of stars that are around the center of the galaxy. When you look at the dark areas that cut across it, those nebulae that Derek was pointing out, those are nebula, those are star-forming nebula, and those are sitting along the Scud and Centaurus arm, and they're not actually in the galactic nucleus. They just appear in that same direction from our point of view, where the galactic nucleus is about 25,000 light years distant from us. The Lagoon Nebula that Derek was pointing out is only about 5,000 light years distant. And this is rotated so that uh, up is the same that we would see up in the sky, kind of in the midsummer. So if the Milky Way was straight over your head, the this picture is rotated such that the up is the uh, same direction there. Um, so another summer object that we commonly show you guys through telescopes is uh, one of the globular clusters in Hercules, M13. Um, so this is one of the largest, actually, this is the largest globular cluster that we can see from the Northern Hemisphere. Um, there's a couple that are bigger that you can see if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, but we can't see them from our Northern Hemisphere point of view. Um, and you can really kind of see how the, the stars have, you know, a reddish hue, and then the ones towards the core have a kind of a bluish hue. And there's, I don't know, what, a million stars in here, Scott? Wow. Messier, well, Messier 13 has about 600,000 solar masses. Okay. So you, you figure a lot of the stars are probably much more massive than a sun. you got some stars at a little lower mass. So you're roughly around five, 500,000 stars in this cluster. Yeah. Okay. About half a million. Um, so the other neat thing about globular clusters is they orbit around our galaxy, um, and they're about as well, in this one in particular is about as far away uh, from us as the galactic core is. This one sits somewhere between twenty-two thousand and twenty-five thousand light years, um, and these are ancient objects that orbit our galaxies. Um, with various formation theories, um, but you know how they actually get to be basically satellites of galaxies, um, which is kind of an interesting thing. So they don't orbit 
along the plane of the galaxy. They kind of orbit in a halo around the, the galaxy. Now, if you take a look inside Messier 13, there's an interesting little piece of pareidolia, something that's like an image that we see. And I never noticed this until one of our friends, Michael Cota, who actually asked a question already tonight, had pointed it out to me one night when we were stargazing. If you look towards the left side of the globular cluster, there are very, very faint, like it's in the dense part of it, there are some very faint lines that actually look like an airplane propeller. And wow. I never, I, you know, I never saw it until Michael pointed it out to me. And now that's the first thing I see whenever I look at an image of M13. Interesting. I don't think I've ever seen that. I don't know that I see it here, but sometimes you get a very different view through the telescope than you do through uh, what a camera will pick up. The human eye has a much, much, much better dynamic range than any of the cameras that we use um, are capable of producing. The next image that I have um, for us is a piece of the Veil Nebula. Uh, this is in the constellation of Cygnus. Um, this is kind of nicknamed the Witch's Broom. Uh, it's a very slender uh, object here next to this very bright star. Um, and the, the Veil Nebula is a supernova remnant. Um, it's, it's a massive object. There's an eastern part, a western part. Mm. And uh, this is, I believe, part of the western part of the, of the Veil. This is... NGC 6960, uh, if you look it up um, online, this piece of the Veil Nebula has its own designation. And this one's um, a pretty fun target for uh, early on astro uh, photographers because of this bright star. It gives you a very nice um, object to use for guiding the telescope. Um, one, of the one of the techniques um, for tracking the night sky and correcting for any mechanical deficiencies of your tracking mount, is you actually have the camera um, send images to the computer and the computer watches that star drift across the camera's um, sensor and then it'll issue corrections to the, the mount uh, so that the tracking is better than it would be if you were just purely relying on the me mechanism of the mount. <coughs> All right, um, and then I have some very early astrophotos that I did uh, a long time ago. Uh, this one's from way back in 2013. Mm. Um, this is M101, uh, which is another, is uh, similar to a galaxy that I showed last week. Um, and it is in the constellation of Earth Major or the Big Dipper. Uh, this one sits about 21 million light years away um, and is like a very nice example of a spiral galaxy um i just wanted to ask is is this the uh the pinwheel galaxy this is the pinwheel yep oh yes. wow dude that is beautiful so this is the dimmest uh, messier object um, by surface brightness oh wow okay yeah I, I absolutely believe it how um how much time has gone into this image oh probably maybe just an hour i mean this okay. was I was first starting to do astrophotography. And unfortunately, where I, where I live now, I don't have a visual on this object anymore. Um, so I have to do it with the gear that I transport. And I've been doing mostly visual uh, down at Frosty Drew in the last couple of years. I uh, just don't have as much time to drag gear around anymore. Right, 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 absolutely. No, it's beautiful, though. I mean, when we're looking at galaxies like this, it's important to note that we're looking at objects that are very distant from us. Like everything we see in the night sky, minus potentially one object, are all in the Milky Way galaxy. So when you look up in the sky, all those stars you see, the, the nebula you see, the Milky Way, I mean, that's all part of this galaxy. When we look at other galaxies, we're looking at an entire collection of billions to trillions of stars that are all together in another galaxy. This galaxy in particular, the Pinwheel Galaxy, is 
about 21 million light years distant from us. And a good, wow. way to think, a good way to think about that distance is at 21 million light years, it took 21 million years for the light to get to our eyes and to Derek's camera. You want to see what it looks like tonight? You'll have to wait 21 million years. <laughs> hey, hey, Scott. Uh, quick question. How does the tracking, uh, Adam wants to know, how does the tracking now track your composition? Or is it just the tracking of the rotation of the Earth? So um, there's two types of mounts. Uh, I'll take that question. Um, oh, sorry about that. Thank you, Derek. It's all good. Uh, so there's, there's, there's an altitude azimuth mount, which is basically aligned to Earth's uh, horizon, and then the vertical axis is just straight up into the sky. And that type of mount, you have to move both axes to track the sky. Um, and then what ends up happening is because the mount is tracking the two axes as the Earth rotates, the field of view slightly rotates, so you get something called field rotation. You actually need a third uh, parameter to rotate the camera as the tripod tr and the mount track the sky. So to simplify that whole equation, um, there's an equatorial mount which you align with uh, the North Star um, and that effectively aligns your mount with the rotational axis of Earth. You only have to move one axis to track the sky. Um, an equatorial mount actually has an alt azimuth adjustment built into it so that you can set up your tripod and mount to your um, latitude. So in New England, we use about 42 degrees north um, so that that angle is correct for, you know, the where we are on Earth's surface, and then you align it um, basically on the ground left to right, so it points at Polaris. Um, and then there's a motor on the mount that basically rotates the mount at the same rate that the planet Earth is rotating, which is about 15 degrees an hour. Um, it's a little bit different because um, we aren't actually at the center of Earth, so some of the mounts can actually correct for the atmospheric distortion that the atmosphere lensing that happens near the horizon less of an issue towards um, the, az or the azimuth, which is straight up, straight up, and then you get the lensing again back towards the west um, <clears throat> as the mount continues to track an object through the night sky. Now, when, it, when you come down to tracking like this, this is why we tell people that if you want to get into any kind of astro imaging, that the mount is where you want to be spending your money. Mm. Because, because if you got an awesome camera and you have an awesome telescope and you got a mount that's not that great, then all the images you're going to collect are going to be, the stars are going to be streaked, your objects are going to be blurred because you're not going to be tracking well. And you would do so much better with more of a, a basic camera and a basic telescope on a really excellent mount because then all of your images will be clean. You can see in this image the stars are not round um, and that's due to <clears throat> tracking error um, when the components of this image were being captured. So. And the last one I have for you is uh, an object I haven't tried to image in a very long time, but it'll probably come up around the, again this summer. It's called the Bubble Nebula. Mm. And you can see here you've got like this nice diffuse nebulosity. And then right here in the middle is this perfectly defined bubble. Um, so that's kind of a new object. Um, unfortunately, it isn't apparent at all when you look visually. So this is really something you can only do with um, a telescope with a camera. Um, and this one was shot at about 1,000 millimeters. Um, so it's going to be having uh, kind of a, a long lens. What would we consider a long lens for a camera to be able to capture? That's 600, maybe? Uh, maybe 600, more? 600 could do it. Um, this image is 1,000. And this one oh, is yeah. the, um, the constellation Cassiopeia, uh, which James showed us an awesome super wide field of. And I actually don't know where in that super wide field um, this would be. Um, but this is somewhere between 7,000 and 11,000 light years away from uh, our planet of Earth. 
Wow, that's great. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I would know where to start either. I know when I was looking into that s- section of the sky, Cygnus and Saturn, um, where you were mentioning, um, I was only able to find the crescent in such a wide field. So I can imagine that it's got to be, you know, microscopic at that focal length. Yeah, I mean, it, at this focal length, the full, mu- the full moon takes up the entire field of view. Wow. Um, this, is, this is smaller than some of the craters on the moon. Wow. What's awesome about this image, too, is that you're getting a visual representation of the stellar winds of the star that's in the center of that, that bubble feature. I mean, when you think about the sun, you have this constant output of, of energy from the sun. It's, it's plasma, it's magnetized, and we call this the heliosphere or the solar wind. And all stars have a stellar wind like this. In the case of the bubble nebula, you have a star that exists inside a, a nebula, a, an area of star formation. So there's a lot of activity in this nebula that causes it to be visible. But the intense stellar winds from the star that's inside the nebula is blowing out so hard against that molecular cloud, that nebula, that it's pushing it out and ionizing it at the same time. And it gives us a visual representation of the actual heliosphere of that star. And... That's very impressive to see that. And this is a fantastic image. Derek. Right. Absolutely. I agree. It's, it's amazing to see the bubble in such detail. I mean, I was absolutely blown away when I saw this item or object for the first time on Google. And this is just a great representation of it. To, to see that there's a bubble in space, like it, it's kind of surreal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty neat when you start capturing these images and, you compare them to, you know, the images that you can find on the internet, and you're like, yeah, I can see the object in there. And then, you know, like, <laughs> you, you know, and you're like, ah, it's starting to look, you know, like uh, the images that I can find online. And then you realize that, you know, you were you were trying to shoot three or four objects a night when you were first starting off because you were super excited. And <laughs> it's going to be like one or two objects a year. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right, right. To do it right. No. Right, exactly, though. Yeah, it, it takes takes a ton of time to even yeah. get it and then you know just to, to to see some of the comparative like details in some of these shots when we go to research before we go and shoot something it's just mind-blowing i think uh when i looked at that section of orion that i was showing you guys it was a bit more of a um panorama mosaic uh that they put together but it was like 212 hours worth of exposure and i'm just like I can't compete. Like I cannot compete, but I'm going to start now. <laughs> so. All right. That's all I had dug up off of uh, my uh, archive. All right. I got a, I got a couple of shots here on this show and mm-hmm. they're from this past. Most of these are from this past month, but I'm going to, I'm going to start with a quick image of Messier 13, which Derek already showed us. But Messier 13 has that, I'm going to show everybody that feature that I was talking about in it. The, what looks like a propeller um, inside this object. So let me swing over here real quick. So this here is Messier 13. And this is the globular cluster that is in the constellation Hercules. That's commonly referred to as the Hercules cluster or the Keystone Cluster. And in this image, you this is a little bit more magnified than Derek's. You have a a series of dark lines in it right over in right over in here. Right here you got a dark line and you have another one over here and it forms what almost looks like a propeller. And when you look at a telescope, it's actually quite noticeable as well, and you'll see it very easily. And this is an object that we're gonna that's in the sky now. It was actually on our list tonight of objects to show if the sky was clear, we were actually able to use live viewing. And this is gonna stay with us for the spring, and it's gonna continue with us through the summer. And at times at Frosty Drew, when it's at the zenith, the top of the sky, you can just barely make it out. To the naked eye, and this is a fabulous globular star cluster. 
Wow. So here is an image from earlier this month. This is when we had those fabulous conjunctions of Venus and the Pleiades. So in this image here, we have the Pleiades open star cluster. So the Pleiades is also known as the Seven Sisters. A lot of people mistaken it for the Little Dipper because it looks like a Little Dipper, but it's actually not even... It's not even its own constellation. It's in the constellation Taurus. Now, Venus is obviously the ridiculously bright object right here. And Venus passed very close to the, actually passed right through the Pleiades and during the first week of April. When you look to the right side of the screen here, you have this streak, this vertical streak that's slightly curved. And that's the International Space Station that passed through the field that night. And I didn't plan this. I set up to shoot the conjunction of Venus and the Pleiades, and we had a lot of clouds passing through that night. And we got a clearing, and you can see some of the haze towards the bottom left of the image. And then I was watching the ISS go by, and I'm like, wait, that's getting pretty close to the conjunction. And when I went back through my data sets later that night, I realized that the ISS had passed right through the image. It made for a fantastic view. Now we see the ISS in periods throughout the year. We'll see it sometimes at night. Sometimes we see it in the morning and sometimes we don't see it at all. And it usually comes in cycles of about two weeks. And we'll see the ISS again in May come through the night, the evening hours. Now as we move closer to the summer solstice, the ISS becomes much more visible to us over the course of the night because the ISS has to be in sunlight or any satellite for that matter it needs to be in sunlight while the observer, us on the ground, has to be in nighttime. Mm. In the winter time, when we're closer to the winter solstice, we get a very small window of opportunity to actually get that happening over our location because we spend more time at night than we do during the day. But as we move into the summer solstice and we're tilted 23.4 degrees towards the sun, it's very easy for satellites, including the ISS, to remain in sunlight while we're in shadow. And sometimes you'll see the ISS pass overhead every 90 minutes or every pass that it makes over the course of the night around the solstice. That's incredible. That's a beautiful image too, by the way. Thanks, James. Thank you. This here is an image that I actually captured with James this past week. So we have this time of the year, we're looking at the, like I said, this is our Milky Way season at Frosty Drove. This is when we get into looking at the Milky Way. This is when we try to capture our image of the Milky Way at Frosty Drew. And the reason why we think it, this is the best time of the year is because you get the Milky Way in the morning hours before sunrise. This image was captured roughly around maybe 3.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. And at this time, the Milky Way comes up out of the south. It stretches really nice into the sky. It's very dark out because even localized light pollution you know the localized businesses or local people in the neighborhood a lot of people have their lights off at that time so you get the lowest point of light pollution for the night and also you tend to get a time of the night where the ground is completely cooled off it's no longer radiating heat from the sun like you get during sunset or in the early hours of the night and when that happens it allows all of that moisture in the atmosphere to settle on the ground is dew, and the sky becomes much clearer. So this just works out for us. And not to mention our southern sky at Frosty Drew is the best sky to observe the Milky Way in. And at this time of the year, that's directly where the Milky Way is at. Now, if you take a look at this image, you also have on the top left over here, two meteors. These are Lyrid meteors. And James and I were out that night to capture a couple of different images. But we were also out to observe the meteor shower and to see if we could actually capture some lyrids. And like I said earlier, we were very surprised at how many lyrids we were actually seeing that night. For a shower that's usually pretty weak and slow going, we had a lot of activity that was just kept going. And in this image, I actually was able to capture two of these meteors. Now, like James was saying earlier, this is a composite image. What I did with this is to try to get as much detail as I could in the Milky Way, you know, all of these little wisps 
and these wisps up here that kind of head out over towards the bright star Antares and the nebula that's around the around Antares. This is, I put the camera on a clock drive or on the top of my mount and I shot two 120 second exposures for a period of about 30 minutes. And when I did that, you get really fabulous shots of the Milky Way, but the ground is all blurred because you're tracking with the stars. What I did after I shot that is similar to what James did. I turned off my clock drive, orientated the camera so it was level with the ground, and I captured my landscape photos. I captured them at the same exposure time, but I captured them at a slightly different ISO, so I would get a little less noise. And I processed the images separately. So I processed one set of images with just registering or aligning everything on the ground. And then I the second set on the sky. And then I combined them together using a mask. And though you wouldn't see these colors if you were out with us or out looking at the sky at this time of the year at Frosty Drew, you would notice a lot of the detail. You would slightly notice the pipe nebula right here. You, you would notice very slight hints of what we call the dark river to Antares. You would see the Antares in the sky quite brightly. And you would notice all of this in grayscale. You would see the brightening of the galactic nucleus. You would see the glow around it. And you would notice the Scutum Centaurus arm right here cutting across the center. You would see the glowing points of the Lagoon Nebula, as well as the, some of the glowing points of the, the Eagle Nebula. And you would notice how this all tapers off, but it would look gray to your eye. And that's because when you're looking at the night sky, these objects are very dim. You're looking at a very small amount of light and you use the part of your retina that allows you to see at night. They're called your rods and they don't see in color. They see in grayscale, which is why when we look through the telescope, which is why when you look at the Milky Way, it often looks kind of bluish gray. That is incredible. And I'm, uh, Awed by the sensitivity of that new Canon RA that you picked up too, as well. Yeah, so this this image was captured with uh, a Canon RA. It's a camera that I've been using for some of the work I'm doing with Brown University right now, and so it's not my camera, but the sensitivity of that camera, it, James is spot on. Like it's amazing. And the one of the astronomers at Brown that I work with, his name is. Robert Horton is a fantastic night photographer. He's, in, he's a legendary telescope maker. He captured some images of celestial objects using the Canon RA, and he captured three sub-images, and I'm able to process a substantial amount of data out of those images, which I would normally have to be doing with 60 sub-images using something like a Canon 60D. The Canon RA is a fabulous camera though it is very expensive as well. So I don't know if it's going to be all the rage, but I'm enjoying my time with it while I have it. Right, absolutely. You know, definitely a great investment if, if, if you're in the, in the field for uh, something at that price point and want that sensitivity. Don't necessarily just want to buy a used camera and have it sent out. Canon is producing these cameras from factory to be more sensitive uh, to things like hydrogen alpha, which is just amazing because I I should also know overall the colors just look so natural with the addition of the sensitivity. Right, right. Those hydrogen alpha wavelengths, which it's hard to see with human eyes. They just stand right out. Yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful and magentas. There's so many things in the galaxy that are emitting that light. So being able to capture those wavelengths is very beneficial. And right. Though this camera does allow in some of the hydrogen alpha wavelengths, which are on the low energy side of the spectrum, the red side of the spectrum, it, it still is a broad spectrum image. There was, we're not using a filter here. I'm not isolating narrowband emissions. This is just broad spectrum light. And as James was saying earlier, at Frosty Drew, you can pull this off. If you tried to do this where I am in Providence tonight, you, you would end up with just <laughs> a very bright, gray lit sky yeah. you wouldn't have any of this detail so and i have another image here that i'm going to throw up now this is the this is messier 41 and this is an open star cluster in the constellation canis major now 
open star clusters are what happens after a, a nebula, a star forming nebula, like the Orion Nebula or the Lagoon Nebula or the Trifid Nebula, when enough stars form inside that nebula that they end up blowing all the gas away. What emerges is a cluster of new formed stars that are all gr loosely gravitationally bound to each other. And in this image, you can see there's a series of different colors. These colors represent the temperature of the stars. These blue stars in here, these are the hot stars. When these red stars are the cooler stars. And these stars, did, like I said, they have a loose gravitational balance. Though over a period of about 500 million years, these stars will be subjected to a lot of different things that happen in the galaxy. They'll be exposed to things like other hydrogen clouds passing through. They'll be exposed to things like supernova remnants and that expanding shell from that supernova passing through this cluster. There'll be stars in the cluster, the high mass stars, these blue stars, they'll die and turn into white dwarfs and that process passes through the cluster. And all of these events, these things, they kind of cause that gravitational balance to almost vibrate. And on the end of the cluster, stars will start to detach. Stars usually detach with the stars near them, and they remain gravitationally bound for their entire lives. This is where we get our multiple star systems from and our binary star systems from. But occasionally, stars will detach alone, and that's what the sun did. And when you look at collection of all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, about, you know, we're talking 200 billion stars here at least. 68% of all these stars are binary systems or multiple star systems, which places single star systems like the solar system with just one star, the sun, in the less common group. Now, it's important to note from an observational standpoint, this object is a fantastic binocular target. This is, falls into a category of objects that are pretty big in the sky, and looking at them with a telescope, you you kind of just see like maybe like this section right here or just parts of it and you miss out on the much the the more grand features that you would see by looking at it with a much wider field object like binoculars now when you're looking in the sky if you wanted to find a super binoculars you would look for the really bright star sirius sirius is the second brightest star in earth's sky we often ask people at the observatory if anyone knows what the brightest star in the sky is and you you see people thinking in like the North Star, but it's actually the sun. So <laughs> as far as the night sky goes, Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. And if you find Sirius, just track down a couple degrees below Sirius and you will find this object with your binoculars. Now, I, I have a little bit of data from Venus and I've been capturing Venus images for the Brown Physics 220 labs that are all remote now, like all of us working remotely. And I was gonna throw a couple of these up. So I'm gonna start with an image that I captured of Venus on March 27th. Here we go. So on March 27th, Venus was pretty much at what we call third quarter. So when you take a look at this image right here, you have Venus looks like a half moon. And like the moon or all objects that are closer to the sun than we are, we see them in phases. So when you look at Jupiter or Saturn, you always see them in their full phase because we're looking away from the sun to see them. And sunlight is shining on them from the same direction that we're observing them from because sunlight has to pass us to get there. When we look towards Venus and Mercury, we're looking towards the sun and we only see the side of these planets that is in sunlight. So in this case, half of one fourth of our view of Mercury or Venus in this case is in sunlight and the other fourth of it is in shadow or in nighttime. And then the other side of it we don't see, which has the same general view as we have on this side. But Mercury is waning. I'm sorry, Venus is waning. And as Venus moves around the sun, it is getting thinner and thinner, though it is getting closer and closer to us. This image here, the next one I'll show you, was captured on April 6th. 
And here you can see that Venus has started to move into the waning crescent stage or phase for that matter. And this was taken right around the time that Venus was at maximum eastern elongation, which is when it's going to appear the highest in the sky for us at sunset or after sunset and gives us our best viewing time of Venus. And we call it maximum eastern elongation because when you look up at Venus in the sky, it's on the eastern side of the sky than the sun. Now, once Venus passes this uh, in between us and the sun, which is called inferior conjunction, then we're going to start seeing Venus rising in the morning before the sun. And eventually it reaches maximum western elongation when it's at its highest point in the morning sky before the sun rises. Now, when you look at this image here, you see a mix of blues and like almost reddish yellows. The blues in this image represent cloud features in that really heavy, thick, cloudy atmosphere that surrounds Venus. I mean, Venus is always under clouds. Now, here is an image of Venus that was captured on April 16th. And you'll see that it has waned even further. And in this image here, we're talking about maybe 36% waning crescent phase. And tonight, it's about 30% waning crescent. And this is the time to be looking at Venus because Venus is going to continue to look brighter for the next couple of weeks, even though it's getting thinner. And that's because it's getting closer to us. But Venus will continue to wane and it will eventually get to the point where it's so thin that you'll see just like a 3% crescent and it will, be, it will appear fabulous in a telescope. So we're down to our last 15 minutes here. And I wanted to kind of give James a little more time to kind of close out what he was talking about early and maybe show us a few more things. You up for that, James? Absolutely. All right. It's you. All right. Let me get back over to the screen share in here. Right. Um, so I, I, I wanted some clarification on this as well, too, Scott. Um, I did a, uh, a full moon workshop. Um, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's not the best image, but I, I wanted to capture what I was seeing and, uh, because I believed it was very similar to a moon halo. Um, and it was during a full moon workshop that I did at the Situate Light um, in Situate, Massachusetts. A uh, very beautiful location. But I noticed that because I was imagining because of the cold temperature and the very bright full moon, it was almost again reflecting off of ice crystals in the atmosphere, creating this rainbow-like um, object in the sky. Maybe Scott can clarify a bit more on what this is. Now, is this around the moon or is it off to one of the sides of the moon? This was off to the side, almost similar to a sun dog or a moon dog. Yeah, so that's probably what it is. It's probably a moon dog. Okay, I was... So, now, so I'm going to say that the, the moon in this case would have been to the left of it in the image, right? Um, I believe this was on the right side, but you could be right. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a bit foggy for me, but uh, I, I believe it was on e uh, either one of the sides. But the, it was actually appearing on both sides of the moon. Right. So these are what you're looking at is, again, you're looking at what you said, concentrations of ice crystals. And the reason why I think that this is the sun dog from the right-hand side is because the reds are on the left in here, and then the blues kind of move off to the right. And when you get this separation of light from refraction in these crystals, the red light is always on the inside of the halo, where on the outside of the halo, it tapers off to the blues. Okay. So, and... We see sun dogs during the day, typically at sunset, because when the sun gets low enough to get into clouds that are moving in, it becomes visible. And again, it's ice crystals. But moon dogs, which is the same uh, process, they look fabulous if you catch them at night. And wintertime, fall, spring is when you see them the most, because that's when temperatures are cold enough to get that type of moisture that freezes in the atmosphere. Ah, okay. All right. That did, was just completely set back. I mean, everybody there, um, I was just telling them to maybe make sure that they grab some some sort of image. You know, it didn't, you didn't really need to be tracking or anything like that. This was so visible to the eye that, you know, in a couple of seconds of exposure time, 
you were able to capture this uh, or these these dogs in the sky. So I was just odd because it was the first time I was able to see them uh, at night. Like you mentioned, Scott, normally, you know, you, you see them pretty frequently during the day. Uh, but at night, this was a first for me um, for it not to be a whole halo around the moon. Um, so just a couple more images. This is a recent um, excursion. I went down to Bluff Point State Park after hours and took the uh, couple of mile walk out to the point, which is actually a surprisingly dark spot. You really are only dealing with residual light pollution from things like Fisher's Island and the very tip of Long Island, which is incredibly dark out in Montauk. Um, and I went about this image um, a little differently. This was actually the first time I, I, I did a uh, HARGB composite where I combined those two um, channels or those two uh, filters to create one uh, sky image. And that is, again, so I can see the uh, red, amber, orange, and all of the rest of the hydrogen alpha in, in great bright color detail. Um, again, uh, it is a composite image. Um, so uh, I did a longer exposure for the foreground, and I, bl or excuse me, I masked these two together. Um, but what I loved about doing the wide field HARGB is I'm able to see a lot more detail um in the colors like i was just mentioning um but in great detail um the images that we were looking at from the observatory from when me and scott went out during the lyrids um i didn't implement any narrow band data into that so i i was very impressed with the color but to combine the two together i was just set back in my chair doing the processing because the reds that <clears throat> i was already working so hard to try to, you know, um, gain and uh, retain. Um, now it was almost just an ease. I was actually reducing some of the colors and stuff, so they weren't overwhelming, especially in this part of the sky. Um, you, you, ha you have a lot of color detail going on, so I actually had to draw it back a bit. But over here in Antares, um, there was also... A um, a lot of hydrogen alpha as well going on too. So uh, normally I'm not getting this much color detail in my night skies, even with a modified camera that's been modified to be a bit more sensitive to hydrogen alpha wavelengths, or should I say ultraviolet and infrared wavelengths. So um, there's that one there. Um, and I believe this is the last one here. This is um, actually a uh, composite as well, too, but it's made up of two separate locations. Um, and normally I don't always do it. Um, I try to keep it as natural as possible. One thing, at least as an artist, I like to steer away from is having it be two completely dark sky experiences. So granted, it was shoot a shot on two separate nights, but I wouldn't like to com combine a sky from Maine with a foreground from closer to New York. That's going to be a lot more light polluted. It just doesn't feel as natural to me. So this image is composed of two separate nights in Cape Cod. Um, if you're familiar with Cape Cod up in Provincetown, they have this dune shack community and it is beautiful. They have trails. Um, you can park nearby and you can walk out to these dune shacks that, you know, artists, um, musicians there's all there's all sorts of just artists in general that live in these communities bring the families as well too and they have these beautiful homes set up throughout these sand dunes and you know we do our best to keep our distance we don't want to invade anybody's privacy at all um but we also want to indulge in some of this beautiful composition it's very rare that you have houses in the middle of sand dunes um so to be able to get that um was amazing um, so I grabbed the, um, the foreground again as the um, daylight was receding. So this would technically be a blue hour twilight composite. But this, this, the, uh, the sky was composed of a night um, spent at Coast Guard Beach when I did my workshop in March to open up this year. Uh, so before 
um, everything started to um, get travel bans and stuff like that, I was able to do the first workshop. So um, I was able to get about two hours worth of sky. Um, and then later on, I took those two separate uh, elements into uh, Photoshop and I blended them together to make ultimately this one uh, image composite that you're seeing. Now, James, can you tell us a little bit about your workshops and how people can get involved or learn about them? So uh, let me let me hop right over here real quick for you because uh, I did have it open in the background. So it, um, we'll start at the top here. If you uh, visit ourgalaxyworkshops.com, can you guys see that? Yep. Okay. If you visit our Galaxy Workshops, um, I've um, tried try my best to keep the schedule um, updated as best as possible with everything going on. I appreciate everybody's patience and kindness during these times um, because we're all going to get through together. But in the meantime, it has slowed us on the workshop side of things, but we will get back. So if you do visit the Our Galaxy Workshops website, you'll see uh, down in the schedule section that that's where we post our events. And we also provide the entire um, event detail. Also a place for you to register. We provide a rain date as well, too, um, because this is New England and the weather doesn't always work out like we want it to. Um, and, but I also uh, cover a checklist um, for the brand new people that are uh, completely new to this sport and, and aren't sure what to bring. They might have the tools, camera, tripod, but they might not know necessarily what to bring or just maybe are unsure and maybe want some ideas. So I provide this really generic list of uh, items that are going to help you along the way. Uh, believe it or not, I the reason why I keep layered clothing on there Number four, if you guys read down that list, is because even during the summer, uh, some of the nights can be extremely cool. And some of the areas that you move into during the warmer seasons, you have a lot of bugs, too. So while you're sacrificing your body temperature, you, you may be making out on the other end in bug bites. So <laughs> I thought I should note that. Um, so you, you can actually find all of the information um, on ourgalaxyworkshops.com. If you're using social media, uh, you can find us on both Facebook and uh, Instagram at our Galaxy Workshops, just like the website domain name reads. It's all one word, nothing fancy. Um, and then um, if you also scroll through, you have some examples from the attendance uh, from the workshop. I like to provide these to display some of the amazing work from uh, some of the very talented people that do join us. Um, you don't always have brand new people that come out to these workshops, but you have people that are just there because they want to enjoy the night sky as much as you do or from a, a much more favorable location. So it's it's very versatile. These workshops are we can help or we can help and contact brand new people, but we can also bring people out that aren't living in favorable uh, locations to enjoy the night sky so they can kind of plan and make a whole uh, night out of the deal. Um, so if you, uh, just to give you a bit more, um, explain the interface of the website a bit better, you can browse our services as well too. We, all, uh, we also offer uh, group um, workshops, but we also do one-on-one -on -one workshops as well too. I also do provide post-processing workshops um, as well too in groups or one-on-one -on -one as well. But also, if you were to follow that menu down, you can actually um, get a slideshow of all the images that have been provided by our attendants. Um, I always leave this option open to people um, if they feel comfortable enough and they want their work shared. I, you know, love it to death. Um, I definitely want to make sure that you guys' work is displayed first and foremost. Um, and then I will give people the brief description of the image when it was taken, what it was taken with. Um, I don't always go into the, the, the details of the capture because I would need to ask everybody what their shutter speed was, aperture, uh, ISO. But it just gives people an idea of uh, how the image was obtained. Uh, you keep going down further. We've done star trail workshops where you can uh, view a preview uh, 
of the vid- video that I put together from the night uh, spent on Mount Greylock. Um, Mount Chakarua, that was another Star Trail time-lapse workshop that we ran. And then if you're, if you're not using social media and you would like to just get a glimpse at my night sky work, uh, all the way down at the bottom of that page, I wanted to save my stuff for last and put you guys first. Um, but you can take the opportunity to look at some of my night sky work. Beautiful. These, these are beautiful shots, James. And your presentation tonight was fantastic. Your, your, you. work, your work really is stunning. And your attitude is, is amazing. And like, we're so happy that you joined us tonight. And I love seeing you out in the field. And whenever you come out to the observatory, it's always like, it's a great night. I feel like once I hear you outside or I see you walk in the room, I know it's going to be an awesome night. So James, keep up the good work. Keep up with, with everything you're doing and your learning and, you, and your, your positive attitude. And everybody else, check out James's site. We posted it to the chat, ourgalaxyworkshops.com, and try to attend one. I mean, you'll learn a ton from James, and you'll get a really awesome night out at some fantastic locations. Now, we're going to try again next week for live viewing. We have to work with what we have with the weather. I mean, this is springtime in southern New England, so this mm. is not fear that it rains and that it's cloudy. Yeah. But we're working with it, and we will bring you a night of live stargazing even if we have to fight it. <laughs> so, and until we can open Frosty Drew again, we will continue to do this every week. Now, we, are gonna, we have an update on our site that we try to keep as current as possible about our, what's happening in our situation. And when we can open again, we will be sure to let everybody know because we will celebrate that day. But until then, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And if you learned anything tonight or had... Uh, just, just a really good time. Please visit the donations link at the bottom of the, in the description underneath the video. And also check out James's site and perhaps pick up some of his prints because they're awesome. So thanks again, and we will see you all next week. Thank you.